On the morning of September 2, 1945, representatives of Japan standing aboard the U.S. battleship, the USS Missouri, signed a document called the Japanese Instrument of Surrender, marking the end of World War II. Less than one month after the U.S. became the first and only country to use a nuclear weapon on a foreign adversary. Despite both fighting for the Allied powers throughout World War II, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics in the United States of America would quickly find themselves ideologically opposed in the post-war world. The USSR widely touted communism as the key to a successful country, while the US believed strongly in the ideals of capitalism. As burgeoning superpowers, both nations knew that their actions could influence how smaller nations operated, and both feared a world where every nation but them subscribed to the opposing ideology. In wanting to avoid another widespread global conflict, however, especially now that nuclear weapons had entered the mix, this tension gave way to a cold war. This Cold War showed itself in the form of supporting different sides of proxy wars and attempting to install leaders in other nations that align with their own philosophy. But it also meant trying to lead by example culturally. If you could show off your country's success and achievements, then other countries would see your ideology as the best way forward. One of the most notable of these instances became known as the Space Race and it would eventually give way to the creation of NASA, and eventually... That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Landing humanity on the moon. The United States had a really rocky start to the space race, back before it was seen as a scientific effort, instead being viewed as a militaristic one. The National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, was founded on March 3, 1915 as a response to the beginning of World War I in 1914. As Europe had been gearing up for war, they had been making advancements in their airplane technology, meaning that despite powered flight being invented in the United States, within a decade of its creation, the nation was already falling behind. NACA was the proposed solution, a committee of government, military, and private industry coordinating an effort to prepare for the possibility of the United States entering the Great War. The following decades saw many of the top aviation experts, both engineers and scientists, working in NACA's increasingly advanced research facilities. Following the conclusion of World War II, the advent of nuclear weaponry compelled NACA to turn its eyes to long-range supersonic missile technology the kind that would allow the United States to fire nukes at high speeds on enemies around the globe without needing to fly a plane over the intended target like the B-29 Superfortress bomber had in the case of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But while NACA was working hard on the technology that would allow pilots to scrape the edge of space, the United States military was trying their hand at doing the same. During World War II, German scientists proved extremely adept at the science of rocketry. With their V-2 supersonic ballistic missile developed to strike military and civilian targets. This was the world's first large-scale liquid propellant rocket vehicle with a range of around 200 miles. Naturally, to combat this technology, the U.S. Army Ordnance Corps began researching jet propulsion with Caltech. Yet, even after winning the war, it was clear that when it came to rocketry, the U.S. just wasn't making advancements like the Nazis had. And in one of the earliest signs of a potential rivalry with the USSR, the U.S. took the opportunity to recruit the Nazi scientists after the war to come to America and put their efforts toward the U.S.'s cause in a program called Operation Paperclip which saw the relocation of around 6,000 scientists and their families along with research, hardware, and even more than 100 of the V-2 missiles. Not all of the rockets went to the Army, however. You see, at the same time, the Navy and Air Force were pursuing their own rocketry research. If this sounds disjointed and uncoordinated, that's because it was. Technically, the Army was to develop technologies for missiles and space communications, while the Air Force was more focused on satellite research, and the Navy, on the other hand, had constantly shifting priorities. At one point in 1949, they were testing their own missiles at Cape Canaveral, while at the same time competing with the Air Force who had declined to collaborate with them on satellite assignments, as well as other space-based missions. While this 1946 to 1954 timeframe saw numerous inventions and innovations, there were also some big perspective shifts, like satellites going from being initially considered as a potentially viable space-based weapons launch system to being viewed as significant for its support role in military missions. And on July 29, 1955, with tensions in the Cold War well underway, 
President Eisenhower officially made the announcement that the US would launch a satellite into space. Their ideological opponent wasted no time in responding. Just four days later, the USSR announced that they too would be launching a satellite into space. Now, it was official. The starting pistol had been fired, and the space race was on. The USSR would land the first blow, shocking the world on October 4th, 1957 with their launch of the Sputnik satellite. It appeared as though the Soviets had won, but in spinning the narrative by shifting the goalpost, instead of the first satellite, now it was who could send the first animal into orbit, then the first man in space, then the first woman, or the first spacewalk. With each shift of the goalpost for a winning condition in the space race, the Soviets managed to get there first. Clearly, the disjointed efforts of the United States military branches were not working. In response, Congress passed the National Aeronautics and Space Act of 1958, which officially saw NACA turning its militaristic operations into the newly created civilian-run NASA. At its inception, NASA was the formal combination of everything the space program had going for it, all into one entity that could take on the engineering problems as a coordinated effort. Other programs of the time, most notably the Jet Propulsion Laboratory the Army had been working with previously, were all folded into NASA. The creation of NASA came with a newfound will to beat the Soviets, especially as President Kennedy made his famed announcement on May 25th, 1961, that America would be landing a man on the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Although, for a short time after this, the USSR still seemed that it was leading in the space race. But each first that was made in space presented a new challenge to overcome, and progress wasn't always steady. As the Mercury missions gave way to the Gemini missions, NASA rapidly developed the hardware needed for safe spaceflight, getting more comfortable with the idea of humans spending days than weeks in space. As Gemini gave way to Apollo, flying, docking, and spacewalking techniques were developed, culminating on July 21st, 1969. As Michael Collins sat in the command module monitoring communications, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped out into the sea of tranquility on the lunar surface. President Kennedy's promise to the American people had been fulfilled. And with Americans the victors, they happily ended the space race. Though, the USSR wasn't happy with the shifting goalposts of the space race, especially since they had lost at such a crucial point of pride for their nation. They tried, in turn, to make a new goalpost for themselves, setting out to launch the first space station, something they would accomplish in 1971, but this just didn't have the same grandiose flair as putting humanity on the lunar surface. In addition, the USSR was simply running out of money to throw endlessly at their space program while also developing other things like their nuclear arsenal. It would continue, just not as fervently as it had before. Although the US landing man on the moon is often seen as the definitive end to the space race, as far as the USSR was concerned, the actual end wouldn't come until July 15th, 1975. As tensions began to ease between the two superpowers, two separate spacecraft were launched into space, docking onto each other once in orbit. It was on this day that both the United States and the USSR would share a first. The first international handshake in space. Putting aside their fierce competition to usher in an era of cooperation, allowing for massive projects like the International Space Station. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel so that you can see more videos like this one. If you want to further support the channel, check out the channel Patreon, linked below in the description. Thank you so much to the patrons who continue helping make these videos possible, and thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.